Well, thanks. Um, I know this is a TWI con conference, so you probably have heard all you want to hear about TWI, right? Yeah, so now you want to hear something completely different, something about Green Berets, you know. So we're going to talk about fashion today because we're talking about hats. <laughs> it's the Green Berets, right? Okay, so here's the first thing we want to do. The part of the Lean Leadership Academy is we, we help develop the leaders that are going to run the new management system we help put in place for our clients. Now, and we have a very intensive leadership development program that goes along with the transformation. But every morning when we come in to, to some of the activities and the training we're going to do every day, um, we usually start with something called a red ball drill. And it's a Nerf ball about this big. And it will suck your brain out because our leaders, we build their ability to think clearly and very quickly by using that red ball. But whenever we start the red ball drill, we kind of get the energy flowing and get ready for the red ball drill. So won't everyone just stand up right now? Because I know it's after lunch and it's warm. Okay. All right. What will normally happen is I'll have a, a, a young man who has a, the red ball, and I'll have him come to the front of the room, and I'll say, keeper of the red ball, post to the front of the room, and he'll come up here, and he'll have the red ball, and he'll hand it to someone. And the leader will then say, leaders want the ball. Now, this happens to go back to a, a movie a number of years ago in America called, with Keanu Reeves that was, that was called The Replacement, and he was a quarterback. But he was a replacement quarterback because the, the actual players had gone on strike. And, and the coach would say, winners want the ball. Do you want the ball? And he said, I want the ball. I want the ball. So we kind of we kind of adopted that. So we said, winners want the ball. But we say, leaders want the ball. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, leaders want the ball. And as loud as you can, I want to hear you say, Give me the ball. Okay? You got that? We're going to practice. I'm going to count to three, and I want to hear you say as, as strongly as you can so everyone out there will know we're here. I want you to tell me, give me the ball. So I'm going to, I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm going to say, leaders want the ball, one, two, three, and then you're going to give it to me. All right? Are you ready for this? All right. Leaders want the ball. Who wants the ball? One, two, three. Art, what do you think? Oh, that's sad. That is absolutely sad. Where's your energy? Don't you want Sweden to hear how strong you can do this? Okay, so let's try that again. Winners want the ball. Leaders want the ball. Who wants the ball? One, two, three. Art, what do you think? All right. Not quite yet. Let's do it one more time. Come on. Just the girls, only the girls, okay, so we'll find out, we're going to isolate this and find out where it's, where it's coming from. Okay, girls only, leaders want the ball, who wants the ball? One, two, three. Give it all. Well, it must be the guys. <laughs> but we're going to do a comprehensive check, so real quick, guys, guys only, and if you're not sure about that, we'll have a special category after this, okay? All right, guys and guys only. Leaders want the ball. Who wants the ball? One, two, three. Give it the ball. Hmm. Must be one of those noise canceling uh, phenomena where the girls are doing it, the guys are doing it, and you're canceling each other out. So it sounds like you're good. So this time, let's do it together. And let's really take the roof off of this place. Are you ready? Uh, <laughs> it's only because you're right there, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. This time I'm not going to count down. I'm just going to ask you the question. Leaders want the ball. Who wants the ball? Give me the ball. Leaders want the ball. Who wants the ball? Give me the ball. Leaders want the ball. Who wants the ball? Give me the ball. All right, have a seat. I think you're awake now. <laughs> and in the Lean Leadership Academy, that's how we start every morning. <laughs> All right, so 
the Green Beret way to develop leaders. Believe it or not, I'm kind of here to share some, some things with you uh, that we do uh, that maybe I know you're not going to be able to do all of it, but perhaps there may be two or three little nuggets in there that you might think is interesting enough to experiment with. So I want to kind of share some things that we do that maybe you can adopt. Just try it out and see if it works for you. And, we'll, and there is a couple of TWI elements in here. So we'll, we will talk about that as well. Just like I think someone mentioned yesterday, uh, the military in the U.S. was part of that development of the TWI program. So when everybody else, de- when the program was decommissioned, we didn't stop doing it. Because we still have to take people every day that never, di- that never jumped out of an airplane before and still teach them how to jump out of an airplane. And they have to do that safely, correctly, and conscientiously, don't they? So, so we, we never really stopped uh, from a job instruction standpoint. Uh, and we have our own version of, say, job methods and job relations as well. So let's uh, take a look at some of the things you might find interesting and you might be interested in, experience, uh, in experimenting with. So believe it or not, this is what I looked like uh, back when I was a cool-looking guy and had more hair. Um, so that's me in the middle, not the one with the brown coat, because I would have loved to have that length of hair right now. Um, I was actually, one, on 9-11, on, on September 11th, 2001, uh, when the, the Twin Towers were attacked, the irony was that day, I was a, a general manager for Crown Cork and Seal Plant, but I still had a very active relationship with my former employer, uh, the United States Army Special Forces, uh, which is also known as the Green Berets. And, uh, and, and I had come off of actually being on active duty, but I was in a special status where I continued to work with Special Forces Command in, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. But at the same time, I was actually a, uh, a, a uh, general manager of Crown Cork and Seal Plant in Salt Lake City, Utah. 9-11 was supposed to be a great day for us because for the past year, we had been competing uh, for Industry Week's best plant. And, the, and we were getting notified on September 11th that we had won the best plant. And so we had, the, from Philadelphia, we had the president of our company come down. I was going to sit there and flip burgers for our guys. And, and we were going to have a good time and celebrate the hard work we had put in uh, to become an operationally excellent plant. And, uh, but, of course, I was on my way to work that morning, and, and things changed. And, and while I was flipping burgers, so we continued to celebrate the hard work that the team had, had put in over the last, really to do a complete turnaround of a plant that was on the verge of being closed uh, about two years earlier. Uh, I was the, uh, when I came in, I was the, the sixth general manager in five years for a plant that was only five years old. And there were some problems there. You, you talk about a culture that had been devastated. Uh, and so we had turned that plant around from, as Art said earlier, being one of the dirty dozen, the bottom of the dirty dozen. Ironically, I was, when, before I got offered the plant, uh, I was actually at a conference in Chicago, and it was the butt of all the jokes there about how bad it was. And I got a call from the president of the company and said, we're, we're warming up the planes, we're going to get on the plane. We're going to get on the corporate jet. We're going to fly to Salt Lake City. We're going to fire three people. One of those would be, will be the general manager, the controller, and the quality manager. Do you want the job? And I worked for a company where they would ask you that question one time. And so we were celebrating that turnaround when, when 9-11 happened. Uh, then my little black pager went off. And yes, a long time ago, we used to carry little pagers. You, some of you may remember what those were. Uh, I, kept, I actually kept two cell phones on me. My Special Forces Command cell phone, a pager, as well as my, corp, my company cell phone. Uh, back then, cell phones were still expensive. And unless you had some other body, some, somebody else paying for it, you usually didn't have one. Uh, and, and, of course, we, I knew what was going on. And I was asked, you know, they said, we need you. Uh, and I said, 
here I am. You want me to start driving? Because there were no planes flying right then. And they said, nope, but as soon as planes start flying, get on one, get here. Uh, so that was on September 11th. Uh, on September the 15th, I, I swore back into active duty, went to Florida, started planning the invasion of Afghanistan. And on October the 15th, 2001, I was on an airplane, as I said, looking at Barcelona, Spain as I flew over. Uh, where we went in and set, in, set up, and at this particular picture here was in a place called Karshikhanabad, Uzbekistan, which is just north of, of Afghanistan. And that's where we launched the invasion south into, um, in, into Afghanistan and took the Taliban down. Uh, I, this was my team, my job. I was the chief of special operations plans. So everything you saw on television during that time, my fingerprints were all over. That was my job, was the combat operations plans, to plan the invasion. I uh, started that in Florida because that, as uh, Christian said, I'm a SAMS graduate, which means that, that, that I've been specially trained in strategic military, advanced military plans. So that's what I do. My specialty is unconventional warfare, or what's known as guerrilla warfare. And we had been out of that for a while, not, not too many guerrilla wars going on, but it just so happens that to me that was special forces bread and butter, and that's what we, I was trying to get us back involved in going back to our basics, the fundamentals. Uh, so since I had been bragging about guerrilla warfare, they said, okay, you're the guerrilla warfare guy. So as soon as the war happened, they, I ended up planning uh, our unconventional warfare phase of, of Afghanistan. Uh, I'm pretty good at blowing things up and breaking things, so when it starts to do stabilization operations, I hand that over to somebody else. Uh, so, so there was a time when I was a pretty cool guy. Now I do lean, which is still cool. <laughs> okay, so uh, that was my team. Uh, yep, see, even I had a beard at one time. So, uh, so one of the things that we try to remember, that's just a piece of headgear, but people know of us, know of us as the Green Berets, but we are the United States Army Special Forces. And all too often, people get wrapped up in that Hollywood image of the version of Special Forces. In fact, these days, more often than not, you see the Navy SEALs, okay? And so you kind of project that image of guys kicking down doors and coming in. Yeah, we do that stuff, too. You know, but, but they have the Hollywood version, but there's a lot of what we do is a little less glamorous than kicking doors down and going in and taking, you know, bad guys out of, out of play. Um, so the other thing is that we also learned that the biggest thing that w our role is inside of the, the military was developing leaders and developing teams. So our biggest job is go in and work with other nations or other forces and help develop them into a cohesive unit and a fighting force that can actually defend their own country because that's usually the thing that they're weakest at. So, so our mission involves learning languages. I do speak a little bit of pretty, about three or four different languages. I speak Spanish. Uh, uh, formerly school trained in that as part of special forces. I speak a little Japanese, a little Thai. I pretty much know how to say, don't kill me, I know secrets in about five different languages. Um, and where's the bathroom and I, I want beer. So other than that, you know, that's about all you really need to know to be able to speak in another language. Okay, so counterinsurgency, we probably know, I'm going to talk about a little bit some of the different missions that we do to give you a broader spectrum of, of exactly what Special Forces does. Uh, number one, we're probably famous for winning hearts and minds because we work real close with the local population. Really, remember, one of the things we want to do is to help them to defend themselves against uh, insurgency and people who want to, uh, to cause them harm and make them self-reliant. We work a lot with, uh, with humanitarian assistance organizations because they are not a combat organization, so we want to provide protective forces for people who are trying to do good things uh, in the countries. And our motto is De Oppressa Liber, which means free the oppressed. And we take that pretty seriously. 
Uh, again, my background is more of what you see here, unconventional warfare. Uh, so, so you see up here, that's that top left, uh, that top left hand picture in the middle of that group is a guy by the name of Harmid Karzai. Probably heard of that guy before. Uh, my friend and uh, former boss, uh, just to the left, uh, just to the right of him, is Dave Fox, who now commands Special Warfare Center. Uh, he was a, at that time he was a lieutenant colonel uh, in the Special Forces. That's his team. And just like John Wayne, he went in, got uh, Harmid Karzai, brought him in to Afghanistan from Pakistan, smuggled him in, put him into a position where he could then uh, become the future president. Uh, you see there, how many people have remembered the, the attack on uh, Balk Valley, the, the cavalry charge up Afghanistan with all our guys, uh, the American soldiers riding horses? Uh, did, did you, uh, do you guys remember that? Well, that was special forces. It just so happens we were getting back into our guerrilla warfare uh, background, and so we had started to learn to ride horses and use pack mules and stuff like that again like we did in World War II. Uh, and so we were pretty freshly trained when we actually had to ride horses uh, as part of uh, the, the uh, invasion of Afghanistan. Um, sometimes, again, we, you probably know us for our counterterrorism missions, so these guys probably not heard of as much as the Navy SEALs because we don't recruit from the street. We only recruit from prior service. We recruit from within. We don't really have a need for advertising with movies and so forth like that. So we really don't do a lot of movies. I think John Wayne did our last movie. And, uh, and so because we can't recruit from the street, we, we don't get the publicity. So we, just, so we don't advertise ourselves as much. We're, we call ourselves the quiet professionals, unless we're doing red ball, okay? Uh, direct action, probably one of our probably more Hollywood-style uh, missions where we actually go in and we attack the enemy straight on, uh, usually very specific strategic targets. Uh, to, and then we also have the sneaky one, which is special reconnaissance, where we go in a uh, long time before you know we're there and we're watching you. Uh, back during uh, Desert Storm, uh, back in the 90s, General, Swar General Norman Schwarzkopf called us the, the eyes of the conventional army because we are usually there looking at what's happening a long time before anyone uh, even knows we're there. And then lastly, this is probably one of our more important, most important missions. We work with our allied forces. Uh, generally, we work with other special operations throughout the world, helping to develop and professionalize their militaries. So we actually teach and train other armies, to, to both in special operations and conventional operations. Because of that, our small team has to be an expert in a lot of things. So... It, if you look at these missions, other than, you know, blowing things up in direct action, our, one of our biggest roles is training other forces. So, so you can see the connection with the need for something like TWI because we have to be expert trainers about the subjects that, that we are experts in because we have to teach other people how to do their jobs safely and correctly and conscientiously. One of the probably most famous organizations about special forces is known as the A-Team. Have you heard of the A-Team before or at some point? Well, the A-Team is a short name for some, something called Special Operational Detachment A. And it's called detachment for a reason because special forces can break itself apart into, a, into different levels to do specific missions. So we actually are referred to deta as detachments because we can be subdivided in multiple ways, all the way up to the full organizational strength. Like you saw, uh, Colonel Fox at that time was able to take his headquarters unit and actually conduct a combat mission, uh, which would be rare for any other organization. So we de and, and his group would have been called a detachment C, an a, a C team, and would have been able to pull off. What you see is a built-in mentorship model as well. Uh, at one point, I was this guy right over here, the captain, uh, which, was, which is what we call the team leader. And that team leader has a bachelor's degree, probably working on his master's degree. He more than likely speaks two, maybe even three languages. 
Uh, and he is specially trained not only in planning and problem solving, systematic problem solving, uh, but he has already been a commander someplace else in, a, in the conventional military. So he's probably led troops uh, of 120, 150 people, basically run the, the equivalent of a manufacturing plant before he even comes to run this small team. Uh, we're pretty rank heavy, so these are high ranking folks. Uh, so the guy next to him is, is the, what we call the assistant team leader. He is a warrant officer, and he is trained in all of what we call the spook skills. So he's able to do everything from fingerprint to code to actually pick locks. So all the sneaky Hollywood stuff that you would think of. Uh, but he also does a lot of intelligence gathering. He knows how to process intelligence information. And then the, the guy down here uh, that's the next guy senior in line has probably the same level as the first two guys is a master sergeant, uh, and he speaks several languages, probably working on his second master's degree at this point because we're very competitive. Uh, and he is what we call the team daddy. He's the senior enlisted guy on that team. Now, the rest of this, uh, the team has a interesting organization. Uh, we have weapons, engineering, medical, and communications, but there's always a senior and a junior, a senior and a junior, a senior and a junior, a senior and a junior. So we have a built-in mentorship model. So there's always someone coming into the team that is developing the next generation of special operations guys. We can also operate in, as split teams, um, and so you've got the senior and junior. How we can operate, we can operate as a full detachment of 12, uh, an A-team of 12 people. We can run in split teams, so we can actually take the warrant officer and myself, we'll split the team into a six to seven man group um, and, and run operations separately. We can also run what we call sub-teams, where we break into three-man teams, which we usually do for reconnaissance missions. Or we can, the minimum team level we will get to is something called the buddy team. We'll come back and talk to that as one of your particular concepts later on. Because one of the things that John liked about our presentation in Toronto is the fact that in Lean Leadership Academy, we actually create this kind of one organization all the way down to the buddy team when we come to our leadership development methodologies. Okay, and at last but not least, we can conduct operations as an individual, though I be the lone survivor. You know, we will continue the mission. So as you can see, one of the things ever, that's a pretty rank-heavy structure, very highly educated, very highly experienced. The other thing is every one of those are subject matter experts. And because of the type of team we, we have, we have what we call shared leadership. I may be overall command of that organization, but at times I hand the leadership of that team off to some of those other members because if we're building a school or if we're building a hospital, we hand the leadership off to the engineers who are the subject matter experts about how to do those kinds of things. If we're running a medical operation and working with, with a country and maybe trying to, trying to help them with, with their medical uh, care, we'll hand that over to what we call the docs and, and, and they will run the mission once we get in and they, we start uh, actually running the medical operation. So. So we, although I'm, I'm the captain in charge, I, we share leadership. So we will rotate that leadership around. When the mission's over and we're ready to return, I take back in charge of the team, and then we'll return the mission. So, so SF leaders are taught from the beginning to be prepared to take the initiative and take a leadership role. So we are developed as leaders throughout our entire career. Uh, and due to the advanced skill natures of what we do, we are cross-trained. Everybody on an SFA team is taught the skills of the other members of the A team. Now, maybe we're not going to have the depth of skill of someone who went through the formal school training, but when Doc says, hey, Captain Mack, I want you to pull teeth, I'm going to pull teeth. He just has to make sure I do it the right way. So, so there's some basic critical skills that we will all learn to be able to support each other with. Now, when they, they ask me to blow things up, I'm good at that too. So, um, so when the time comes, the subject matter experts will take over the mission 
and, uh, and, and they will lead and, until that part of that mission is over with, and then I'll take back over the leadership of the, of the team. So you might say, so what's Toyota have to do with the Green Berets? Well, believe it or not, you can see right there, Toyota and Special Forces has a long relationship. <laughs> Go anywhere in the world, what car are you usually seeing bad guys running around in? A Toyota, right? So, uh, so it, actually, this is not even a real Toyota. I think it was like a, a Mitsubishi van, but we know Toyota is so popular that we just printed out panels and we just hung it over the back and so from a distance you know you can't tell the difference so so and actually the 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 military in general as as uh art mentioned earlier during the occupation uh toyota was and and the u.s the industry the japanese industry was very interconnected with with uh with the uh with the army but uh you know, probably one of the saving graces of Toyota when they had their financial trouble was the Korean War. And one of the reasons was because, you know, a lot of the industry was used to, to make uh, Jeeps and trucks and so forth for, to support the Korean War in Japan. So, so the military does have a connection. And Russ Gafferty, our, our partner, says, who had actually been in the Army Reserves at one point, said, people will be surprised how close Toyota is to the military. Very leadership-intensive organization. And one of the things that we were surprised, and I was pleasantly surprised to see, is that there's so many similarities between SF, Special Forces, and Toyota because we operate in teams. We're a matrix organization, very skill-intensive, very leadership-intensive. Well, that made it a natural match for us. So, so there is a similarity. Just like Toyota, uh, organizational leaders are the main focus of training inside of Toyota because these guys directly influence safety, quality, delivery, cost, productivity, and morale every day in everything they do. In the same way, the United States Special Forces, our team members are the focus of training. And we are intensely trained throughout our career. And, and we're prepared to be globally deployable leaders. We're taught uh, how to build rapport, you know, how to understand and appreciate different cultures, uh, how to work with other cultures. Uh, and we try to actually be part of the di diplomatic core of the U.S. government. Uh, so sometimes we can't tell... Uh, whether uh, who the bad guy is sometimes, but, but we have to have leaders that are capable of sitting down with battle-hardened uh, guerrilla warlords or politicians. And sometimes we can't tell which one of those is the toughest ones to work with. So, um, so current situation. So why am I talking to you about special forces, leadership, and lean? Well, in the U.S., right now, and, and I'm sure it's just as true elsewhere in the world, there is a growing gap in the shortage of globally deployable leaders that can run organizations and the need for leaders. At last check, through a Deloitte uh, talent uh, survey uh, this past year, and I've been tracking it for about four years, it has grown from 29% four years ago to 32% right now. That is, the need for global, globally deployable high potential pipeline leaders and the need for it. So the availability versus the need, there's a 32, currently a 32% gap. There are organizations that need globally deployable leaders and they can't get them. And business schools are, are churning out managers all the time, but what they're saying is they don't have leadership skills. They know how to manage, they know how to do the financial stuff, but they, but they don't know how to lead teams and they certainly don't know how to lead teams outside of their own country, outside of their organizations, and we need people like that. So one of the things I want to kind of cover with you today is how could you possibly kind of close this gap by using some of our methods? because. The one thing that you have to agree that United States Army Special Forces does a pretty good job of developing leaders that are globally deployable. So, and that's kind of our bread and butter. Bread and butter. So, Deloitte's uh, Deloitte uh, st uh, survey uh, from the last one was back 2012. Uh, 
something called Talent Edge. Uh, uh, notice that it was a 31% now, 32% uh, gap between deployable leaders uh, and the organizational needs for leaders. Uh, and then the, the, survey, the executive survey respondents uh, on Talent Edge said that their top five needs as executives were, number one, Developing leaders and succession planning. So you see, they need a pipeline. Uh, they need people who can take over for them. Number two, str they, had, they struggle to keep their, their leadership teams intact. Number three, predicting globally deployable leadership needs and growth needs. Number four, focusing on their leadership pipeline. And number five, closing the gap between being able to, to deconflict priorities versus performance. You know, so they need, they need new leaders, they need leaders in the pipeline, but they have such pressure for performance, they, they can't quite say, well, which one do we need to do most? And, it, and they're starting to suffer from it. Not only that, we found out that a U.S. Manufacturing Institute survey found out that these same organizations say that one of their highest priorities, 48% said their highest priority was find qualified supervisors. So you can see this not only goes at the executive level, but, it, but that need goes all the way down to the frontline leadership level. So it's a critical need. We need more people like you. So lastly, here's the bottom line, as we like to say. We see this problem. They've identified this problem. You know what? They admitted we don't have the talent to develop leaders. We know we've got a problem with it. We don't know how to solve that problem. And someone asked me uh, yesterday why I thought that problem occurred. And I did some unofficial, unscientific research on LinkedIn. And I noticed that most of the people that I was running into in some of our client interactions, that most of the CEOs have a financial background. And then just beyond that, their prior uh, their, their prior positions were not only financial, but they were in private equity. So they came from acquisitions. Used to be that we had operational leaders coming up through the organization, and operational leaders developed other operational leaders. And that's why we were able to build that strength. Today, and like I said, an unscientific uh, LinkedIn survey uh, I looked at the CEOs of most of the organizations that I track, and all of them have in the last five to ten years financial or PE backgrounds. They aren't operational leaders. And so they're not the, the biggest team they've ever led. It's probably about 10 or 12 people that were part of an acquisition team. And so they, they didn't come up from the ranks. They haven't su been supervisors. They haven't been production managers. They haven't been operations managers. They certainly haven't been plant managers. So, so the people who are taken over as vice presidents and executives now have no manufacturing operations background whatsoever other than buying companies. And it's starting to show in our leadership development because if you've never developed subordinate leaders, then how are you going to do it from the top? That's a gap we got to close. I don't know that we can change the, the composition of our executive teams, but we've got to reach in. They recognize it's a problem. We've got to reach in, and we've got to be able to develop those operational leaders that are capable of taking over the companies now at some point in the future. So we've got to develop that leadership pipeline. As Art showed you earlier today that there's an 85% chance of failure as you go down the, the lean road. 85% of the organizations that, that the Shingo Institute had, had surveyed or has, has data on has, has at some point turned back from, uh, from their, their operational excellence journey and not gotten to where they wanted to from a performance standpoint in, in a period of three to five years. The 15% that make it through also kind of taper to a certain extent. Maybe it's less than 2% that actually continue that journey of excellence, both maturing as a lean organization and in performance. Why is that happening? Uh, number one, and we can't hurt and have any feelings hurt in here, uh, but sometimes it's the pathway A here is the love of lean tools, sometimes what, what, what Art and I call the lean zealots. Uh, there's, there's, there's not a depth of leadership 
but they love the tools. Uh, they love the buzzwords. They love to watch other people do lean, but they don't have any direct accountability for performance themselves. In fact, sometimes they find a way to, to, to direct lean, but never be accountable for the performance of lean. So, the, so that's part of part of the leadership weakness that, that, that we're starting to find. And that's why we're losing the performance. And so these guys aren't, they're, 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 they're really uh, happy to, to show you how to use the tools and use the buzzwords, but we're not putting them in responsible roles and have them develop other people as part of their lean leadership role. Being directly accountable for performance. Number two is the charismatic leader approach. The guy at the top thinks lean's the greatest thing since sliced bread, drives the numbers. Uh, and, and, and as long as that person's at, to- at the top, lean's going to be good. But what happens when he leaves? Usually when he walks out the door, lean walks out the door with him. In fact, Art has a story uh, that he talks about, and I can't remember. What was the organization with Kathleen? Okay, Sandia? Yeah, Sandia Laboratory. This lady named Kathleen was doing... Uh, was, was helping to lead the, their lean efforts there, but when when she left, it kind of fell to the wayside. And, and Art told him, "He said you guys weren't doing lean; you were doing Kathleen." And that's, that's so I get to borrow his joke. <laughs> uh, and and so that's that's what we're suffering from is that when when the champion leaves or is is knocked down, then so the lean goes with it. So we need to com- combat against that. So as we go forward, some of the characteristics of what we need from our leaders is clearly to not do path A, path B, but to be able to go up the road of excellence here to path C, where we mature our leaders who are capable of developing both performance, the importance of performance, as well as maturing the tools that we need to use to help gain that performance. Because if you are on a lean journey, you should be maturing your state of leanness over time. You, shouldn't, you should evolve forward. So how can we close the gap using both a combination of the Green Beret way and the Toyota way? Number one, one of the things that we've noticed, and, and maybe this is not the challenge in your organization, is that most organizations rarely have a formal leadership development program. So basically, leadership development is kind of like OJT, do it yourself, bring your own leadership development program, we would say. Uh, there's, no, there's no specific timeline for it, uh, and there's certainly, uh, there's rarely a designated or designed pathway for leadership development, and it rarely integrates a mentorship methodology like you saw with the Special Forces, a built-in mentorship program. And Toyota, they have all of that, but unfortunately it's built around minor model changes and major model changes, which happen in a a three to five year period. There's a built-in mentorship program, but as Art would tell you, it it takes you probably 10, 15, 20 years to build uh, build a good manager and build a good leader. So that takes too long. How many of you guys have 20 years to, to develop your, your globally deployable leaders? Raise your hand. Okay, there you go. This is a perfect model. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so as you see, Toyota does have a very specific uh, pathway for their career development. So, so you can see it, it, we have pre-promotion training and post-promotion training. Again, that's, that's going to be a 20-year journey for most folks. Special Forces also has a very defined timeline. Now, we do it a little bit better. We'll, we'll do this in between 12 and 24 months, uh, depending on the specialty. Uh, but we take people with some background in leadership. Uh, they've probably been, like we said, we volunteer for leadership. Uh, you've, you've probably led someplace else. You volunteered for airborne school to jump out of airplanes. You volunteered for ranger school. And then we go through selection and, and a very intense uh, specialty development course, a leadership development course, uh, ending with an actual exercise at the end where we kind of have a war game where we play our parts, our roles on a team. So how many of you have something that's this well developed? Raise your hand. Well, that's something to try. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things that, that I want to kind of talk to you a little bit real quick is something called Special Forces Assessment and Selection. And if you ask anybody in Special Forces, the thing that we probably spend the most time doing is a three-week phase before you even go to all this training here 
and it's called Special Forces Selection Assessment, and we look for very specific characteristics in people. We have actually quantifiably been able to prove that when we've had failures down the road, it's because somewhere along the line we compromised the value of one of our selection criteria. So they've actually come back the last couple, two, three years and really locked down on making sure that we have psychologists and everything that come in and look at people and say, yeah, these guys are actually the type of people you're looking for, and we test for it. So one of the things that we look for uh, when selecting special forces, uh, number one, integrity. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take a look at how do you evaluate integrity for your potential leaders? How do you test for it? Now, this is not something we can look for proactively. So we put, we put people in situations as part of the assessment program that gives them an integrity compromise to see what will they choose. And it may be simple as say, don't cross that road over there. And if you get caught, ask them, why were you on the road? And I just got lost. Or I felt like I, need, I had a risk, I had a mission to accomplish, and I accepted the risk. Well, guess what? We'll accept that answer. But if you tell us I wasn't on the road, that's an integrity violation. And we have other sneaky ways of checking too. So number two, courage. We look for personal courage as well. Well, we got one exercise where we, we have three or four water cans, five-gallon water cans, and people are carrying them. One of them is empty. There are two people that know it's empty, the guy carrying it and one of the instructors. Now, he's got to carry that for about 12 miles. Does he share that with his team? Does he rotate it through it? Does he just carry the empty can while everybody else is carrying full cans? See, that's an integrity violation, right? Uh, courage. Do you have personal courage? You know, are you willing to stand on your own, you knowing what's right, and it's the right thing to do? Number three, perseverance, as you can see here. We test the limits of what you're capable of. Will you be there in the long run to, when the company, there are times we say there's, there, there's a time to do a lean, transforma lean transformation that's never convenient, and, and then there's a time when it's too late. And sometimes, will you do the hard work right now to do your lean transformation? So you need perseverance. Because as Russ would tell you, when you're going through a transformation, you're going to work two jobs, right? Uh, personal responsibility. Professionalism, we like to say, we like to call ourselves the pro quiet professionals. Adaptability, this is the Kaizen mindset that we look for. When conditions change, can you adapt to it? Can you come up with a better way, a new way? Are you a team player? Not only can you lead a team, but when you're not in charge, are you the best team member? So when you're in the lead, are you a great team leader? When you're, when you're not in the lead, are you a great team member? Because sometimes you get people that are good team leaders, and they're very poor team members. Amen? And everybody said, amen. So, <laughs> um, and then lastly, capability and innovation. So are you capable? Will you, are you constantly working on yourself to, to build your capabilities, not only physically, but mentally, skill-wise, educationally? Uh, and then innovation. Do you have a Kaizen mindset? Do you look at every condition and say, we can make it better? So we actually test and evaluate for these criteria. And in order to be in special forces, just to get into the training, you must prove that you have these skill sets, that you have the willingness to lead and, and, and the willingness to continue to adapt and, 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 and innovate and, and be better. So how do you do that? You have to come up with your own ways. Like I say, we have interesting ways that probably won't, wouldn't, will, won't work as well for you. But take a look at your future leaders and ask, how can we possibly test to see if they're going to be good team leaders? How do we tech, check for adaptability, uh, uh, team player, uh, professionalism, professional responsibility? And see if you can come up with some good ways to, to, to look for it. If you invest in these criteria and some, some of your own that you can come up with, down the road, that's going to pay, pay off for you because you'll have a good pipeline of leaders. And with that, I think, where did John go to? A couple more minutes? We're good then, right? Okay. So with that, 
Thank you very much. I'm going to open it up for questions. This is going to be on, I think it's going to be online or, or something like that. So I'll, I actually put some more slides in there for you to kind of look at on your own uh, that's available for you. So I always kind of do that. Those are freebie slides, you know, give you some more depth and make you go, hmm. You know, so with that, I turn it back over to Christian. Yeah. Any questions for Sam? Presentation, Sam. It's just a comment on the things you had, the surveys about the high potential leaders. Just when I've been reading these kind of uh, studies about high potential leaders, I think it's interesting, as you mentioned, that many companies maybe they don't have any structured or as structured leadership development programs. The articles are more about how do you identify high potential leaders and how do you nurture them, how do you keep them. I haven't seen many articles that says this is how you develop the high potential leaders. It's more like this is a talent that is somewhere, and as a company, you need to capture them and keep them in your company. Yeah, and I would kind of, what I would recommend is, is Deloitte has really kind of taken this as kind of a mission for them. So if you have an opportunity to go to their, their, their website and dig through some of their published materials, especially on the talent edge. There's some great thinking there about how to develop a lattice network uh, so that you take someone at the beginning of their career and through a decision matrix throughout their career, how to mentor them in globally deployable positions, how, how the opportunities to challenge them throughout their career so that they have the leadership opportunities. One of the things that we try to do quite often as part of our process is actually get them to go through the leadership decision-making, planning, and risk assessment cycle as often as possible. And there's some really good articles. Uh, just go on the De Deloitte, uh, probably did, a, as uh, I really appreciate some of the work they've done there. Some good challenging thinking there. Probably 10 or 15 good articles on how do you develop leaders uh, you know, along a career path? How do we develop a network? How do we develop them to make them globally deployable? Uh, it's, and that's a challenge because both operational leadership, executive leadership, and the HR is going to have to work together to come up with a good program that will pay, pay dividends down the road. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, you work together with Art in Lead, Lean Leadership Academy. Maybe there are some questions you can both answer. So Art, would you please come up here? Welcome. Thank you. I will. I will make me stand next to him. Yeah. He might give me like make me yell or something. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, what I brought, I actually snuck this up. I actually brought. I asked Christian to bring Art up. One of the things that is probably one of the highest honors a Green Beret can actually do to you or for you is to actually give you a Green Beret. We very rarely do it usually only the people we most respect in the whole world. And I got to tell you, I've been, I, I was introduced to Art back in 2005, and he's been a great friend, uh, literally, uh, for, for years. And, um, and one of the things that I asked them to do, one of the things I want to be able to do, if you'll join me in celebrating this, I'm going, I'm going to present one of my two greatest mentors his own Green Beret. So if you would, give him a round of applause. Uh, it's not a great piece of headgear. It won't keep the sun out of your eyes. It won't keep rain out of your face. You know, uh, I've, I've only given away three berets in my life. We very rarely do it. I got one more that I wanted to give to Russ when we were at the KPS conference, and they didn't have them ready in time. Uh, but I'm glad. Thank you for celebrating this moment uh, because for us, this is, it, it, it is really to show respect when we hand you one of those things. So, and he's earned it. He's been a great mentor and a great leader 
and a, and a great teacher for me over the years, and he's put up with my silliness as well. <laughs> show me how to wear it. I don't even know how to put it on. I'm embarrassed. You show me how to wear it. All right. Yeah. Sideways? There you go. It looks like John Wayne, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Now, that's the only time he gets to wear it. The rest of it has to be hanging on a shelf someplace. So. <laughs> I'll keep this forever. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's, that's, uh... All right, so yeah. any other questions? Leadership development. We, we put people through their paces, and he's been here with, with me quite a bit. So I'll, I'll tell you something interesting, though, why I started talking to Sam in 2004, 2005, that uh, you know what Toyota's number one problem worldwide is? Not enough leaders. Even Toyota struggles with developing leaders around the world in a short period of time. So there is something to learn. We haven't figured it out, but one thing that his group and special forces does is compress the timeline to create leaders. Uh, in Toyota, the, the weak point is we take you know, 5, 15, 20 years to make a leader. That's a weak point of the Toyota production system we've never studied. And in Japan, it's worse because it's, it's just this long system, long system to get to the top. And that doesn't work in America. It doesn't work well in North American or European countries as well. We have to figure out how to develop leaders that fit the Toyota style faster. So there's something to learn here. I, we don't have the answer yet, but they have special, unique ways of developing leaders in, in two years uh, within special forces. So if we can figure that out and make that a model that also works well in industry, um, it'll be very, very good for all of us. If you kind of looked at it in a bottom line, what do you do to make things more efficient in your organization? Take the waste out, right? Well, we essentially take the waste out of the time perioding experience that a leader takes to be made. Uh, we look for good raw material <laughs> using the selection criteria. But once we pick them, the rest of the course for the next year uh, to two years is to put them through, put the people who are going to be Green, Green Beret leaders through that leadership cycle, planning, uh, decision making, risk assessment, risk taking, over and over and over again, uh, so that we can essentially have someone go through the leadership development experience, probably 10 years worth of experience in a, in a year, because 24 hours a day they're they're making decisions, they're they're assessing risk, they're planning timetables, they're problem solving. And, and so we've got to do the same thing. We just take the waste out and try to find opportunities as part of your, your leadership development program to get people into that cycle so that you mature them quicker. So maybe it's a little bit of an experiment for you. Thank you, both of you. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you, Sam. Thank you, sir. Big hand for Sam.